Hi, I'm Evan Maindonald. Welcome to The Main Thing. Today I'm interviewing Rob Wilkinson. Rob is a legend in the property crowdfunding world. Um, one of the directors of Crowd With Us, um, the two, one of the two main crowdfunding platforms in the UK. Rob, could you just quickly introduce yourself? Yep, uh, Rob Wilkinson, co-founder of property crowdfunding platform Crowd With Us. Okay. Rob, how did you get started in property? Uh, I was pretty fortunate. Uh, I'm a ship's captain by trade. I started at sea very young. At the age of 16, I got given a, the opportunity for a scholarship. Uh, tough decision for a 16-year-old uh, boy. Do I go back to school for two years or do I get paid to travel the world? So that was a, that was a bit of a no-brainer. One assumes you didn't get seasick. Uh, no, no, no. Okay, that's why I didn't become a, okay. a fisherman. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, and one of the benefits of, uh, of working at sea, other than the tax-free status, was the fact that you only ever worked six months of the year. And I get bored very easily, and I, uh, yeah, in my vacation, or in my leaves, I was, um, if I wasn't, wasn't travelling, then, then I decided, yeah, always business-minded, and decided to buy my first property. Uh, at the age of 20, that was. That was in England? That was in England, in London, so, Canary Wharf. Ah, interesting. So, You'd saved up enough money? No, no, I, I uh, actually had been on holiday, spent all my money, so I put the, I put the deposit for the property on a, on a credit card. Okay. Back then you could do that. I rented it out for a year, uh, yeah. paid off the credit card, and actually I bought my second property in exactly the same way. Ah, so how much, how much was the deposit? Uh, at, the, at the time I got a 95% mortgage, okay. so I put 5% on the credit card. Right. And I actually did rinse and repeat for, for, for several properties up until about, that was in 2002, I believe. So did you actually buy that first property and then sell it on, or did you... I've still got it now. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So did you, how did you get the money back out of it? Or you just... I, rent, I rented it out, which paid, there was a very ah. high yield in the property, so that it cash flowed sufficiently for me to pay the, the card off within a year. Right. Uh, I then bought another property, did exactly the same, but this time I had both rents from both properties paying off the card. So you didn't live in it? No, I rented it out. Ah. Where did, did, you, where did you live? Uh, at the time, I was away for six months of the year. Oh, I see, of course, yeah, you're on yeah, the boat. Yeah, Got yeah. it. Okay, great strategy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Good. But my, my second property, I was actually a property that I bought with my girlfriend who was a student at the time in Southampton. Mm -hmm. And that was a three-bedroom house that we converted into a... Well, at the time, HMO wasn't really a thing, but it, we converted it into a five-bed HMO. We lived there for free. Uh, rented it out to, to four of her friends at university, and again, the, uh, the, the rents from that paid off the, uh, the credit card. So it's quite an interesting thing. Um, the way that I, I, the first property that I bought in the UK was in Hammersmith in London, and I did a very similar thing. It, it had four bedrooms. I rented three of them out, 500 pounds a month each. each. My mortgage was, was 500 pounds. The house was, believe it or not, 135,000 pounds. My neighbor told me I'd overpaid. The house is probably worth a million and a half now. Um, but anyway, I went from a situation where I was paying £500 a month in rent, because at that time I was renting a room somewhere else, to a situation where I, was, I had no mortgage and had ne a net income of £1,000 a month. But what's really interesting about that strategy, or that, stra I call it a strategy, but that approach is that a lot of property people I've talked to actually, that's how a lot of them got started. Um, I know Simon Zucci got started that way in in a, I guess in a way so did you, so yeah. Well, it was a convenient, a convenient way of doing it. and. It meant that you had more spare cash to, to put into your next property. Once, yeah. once you've got the bug, you're looking for the, for the next deal. Yeah, exactly. So how many properties did you go on and end up buying then? Uh, at the, I can't remember exactly because I, 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 I went on with that. Um, yes, this, is, this, is, this is a sign that you're, you've got a lot of property experience. You can't remember how many properties you've bought. <laughs> no, no, I'm, I'm just with, with that particular strategy of my credit card, that... Yeah. that if something works, yeah. then, uh, then, then don't stop. So I was still using that strategy. I'm obviously putting my, cash, my own cash in as and when I could. Yeah. But until about 2006, when I think, unfortunately, the banks decided that was no longer such a good idea. I disagreed, but I uh, could <laughs> had, had no choice. So yeah. I then went on, I, I bought a, uh, a property in Kent, which was a distressed sale. And that, that was where I live now, so that was my, my own house. So I knocked that to, to the ground and then rebuilt my, my own property. Wow. So, um, when you say it was a distressed sale, um, does that mean you got, got it at a good price? Uh, a, a very good price, yes. Okay, yeah. Tell me a bit more about that. Yeah, yeah, I, I can't remember the exact figures, but, but what, what actually happened was, the, unfortunately, the, the elderly couple that, that lived there, as a bungalow, the elderly couple that lived there, both, both went senile, 
And as is the way in the UK, the son knew that he was uh, only going to get, the government were only going to allow him to keep a certain amount of, of the money from, from the sale. The rest of it had to go towards their, their respite care. And so I managed to negotiate a, a, a very good price. But this, I was, I was still, I've made every mistake uh, under the sun in property, so I was still very new to property then. Um, a funny story, which I, I guess I can say now. So the first thing I did was I bought a tipper truck yeah. and, uh, and a very large hammer to knock it down. And I had my father working for me at the time. Yeah. And I'd actually, uh, I said to him, if anyone comes round, just say it was like this when, uh, when I started. What, knocked down? Well, yeah, the, we started on the inside. <laughs> okay. And uh, I, I went out to, to, to do a run with the tipper truck and he phoned me up and said, you better get back here now. And I said, well, why is that? And he said, well, building control here. And I said, I'll just tell them that, uh, that it was like this uh, when I bought it. He said, I did. And he said, I've been outside for a week watching you. <laughs> oh, oh, dear. Okay. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, but I went yeah. back, had a chat with the guy and he yeah. said, you really need to get planning permission and uh, do this properly. But it turned out he was also a merchant seaman. Huh. In, a, in, a, in a past life. So we actually got on very well and became very good friends off the back of that. That's really and a lot of very good oh, free advice. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's funny actually because that story I think is probably rings bells with a lot of people. A lot of people when they start out doing stuff in property and doing stuff in property development, they just think I want to get from A to B the quickest way. But you very quickly run into <coughs> regulation. You really you you run into the first one you run into usually is the council, building regs or planning permission or somebody who, who points out to you that you've not done what you're supposed to do, <laughs> and that can become quite a big problem. Actually. Yeah, yeah. Fortunately, it, it, it didn't turn out to be such a, good pro a big problem in the end. But um, but but I think there's two ways of looking at it. You, you, there's a lot of people out there that uh, and there's never a right way or a wrong way. But but for me. I, you can do so much, and I think I'm very big into education and due diligence, but you can spend too long trying to, to, to find out every detail and you miss opportunities. So when an opportunity presents itself, I normally just grasp it and then figure things out as I go along. Hmm. Now that, that's interesting because I think um, a lot of people who deal with managing risk are not very good at seeing opportunity, and a lot of people who are good at seeing opportunity are not very good at managing risk. And in my view, the key skill of a, a property developer is to be able to combine those two things. See the opportunities, understand the risks, understand how to minimise the risks, but also understand how to turn risks into opportunities. So you're looking at this from the angle of somebody who is dealing with property developers all day and helping property developers raise finance, but you're also looking at it from the perspective of someone who organises... Um, investments for investors or, or, or um, uh, facilitates investments for investors. So in your mind, how do you balance out those two things, opportunity and risk, and how do you, how do you make sure that you're not too biased towards one or the other? Uh, very interesting question. Uh, I would say that, that um, I had a I kind of had two, two lives because when I, when I worked away, I was managing large groups of people. And, and many people say that working at sea was a lot different than, than working on land. You always understate what you did when you were working away. And I just, let's just take a little detail here. I want to come back to this question about opportunity and risk. But what exactly were you doing? Well, the, yeah, as a, as a qualified ship's captain, and the, I worked for a number of... Uh, I originally started off in the commercial sector, so cruise ships, container ships, that type of thing. Yeah. Then I got made redundant, and uh, after a few months uh, uh, travelling the world, I actually ended up in the south of France and worked for four years for the Saudi royal family. Yeah. And eventually ended up, uh, after working for a couple of other people in between, uh, also billionaires, um, it was, uh, when, I, when I joined, it was the world's largest privately owned yacht for the world's richest man. Hmm. And are you allowed to say who that was? Um, I, I, I've signed a lot of... Uh, it's, it's, it's the rising sun, so if, if someone Googles that, they'll uh, get a pretty good idea. And you met a lot of interesting people when you did that. Are you allowed I, to talk about that or not really? Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, yeah. Like, Who'd you meet? Um, uh, <laughs> lots of, uh, of, of, of very interesting people. Um, the, uh, one of the last guests that we were getting ready for when I, when I left the boat, uh, the last time I was on there was, uh, was actually Obama, to give you an example. President Obama, mm -hmm. or former President Obama? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Have you met any other US presidents? Uh, former, I've met Trump. 
Really? Yeah. yeah. Wow. Okay. And anyone else who's really interesting? <laughs> um, lots of people. I've, yeah. uh, actually, I did, I did a presentation for, uh, for a, a networking group, for Brendan Quinn, actually. and Because yeah. um, people have asked me about my previous occupation. Yeah. And I, did, I, did, I did a presentation on the five things I've learned from billionaires. And I actually went through the Forbes Top 100. And I'd met 52 of the richest men in the world. Wow. And so what did you learn from meeting people? Because obviously those people live in a pretty rarefied environment. I imagine they're pretty demanding people. They're used to ordering other people around, I would have thought, and they're often, I guess, used to getting what they want. What's it like dealing with people like that? Uh, an amazing education, actually. Uh, working like, like, like this um, in, in this close quarters. Uh, I learned very quickly that a number of them don't understand, or most of them don't understand the meaning of the word, no. Um, do, you think, do you think that's why they achieve what they achieve? Yeah, definitely. They've, they've got an un, most people would say they've got an unrealistic expectation of what's possible, but the, the proof is in the pudding. It's not unrealistic because they've actually achieved it. Yeah. But the, 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 that's why I stayed at sea or in that particular job for, for so long. That I couldn't, I, money couldn't buy the, the kind of um, uh, interaction that, that I got on a, on a daily basis. Yeah. I, learned, I learned so much just from observing them and meeting them and interacting with them. It's interesting, though, that it, I think it proves the point that if you are able to see things and that other people believe aren't, and persistent things that other people believe aren't possible, you can achieve the exceptional. I'm not saying that everyone will, will do that, but I do believe that that vision and that tenacity are what leads to, uh, things that lead to success. I, I would go one step further and say that, that some of them have such a strong belief that, that, they, that people will, will buy into their vision and that they're able to, to sell that vision to other people. So it's about influencing people as well? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that, that, and that, that in itself is very interesting. Mm. Very interesting detour. I'm going to drag you back to opportunity versus risk. You started answering the question and, I, and I'd like you to answer the question. Yeah, no, so, so a lot of people said, was it a, a big jump coming from working at sea? I was there for almost 20 years to, to working on, on land. And, and to be honest, I studied uh, management, project management, and ship construction, naval architecture, and, and managing large refits. So did you do a degree then? Or? In nautical science, yeah. Oh, wow, okay. Um, and, yeah, a, 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 a ship, a, well, we, the yacht was uh, about 500 million build, and a re, an average refit, which would happen every few years, was between 20 to 40 million. Okay. So, so managing that project... That was like managing a big construction project. Yeah, managing the, the, the crew. In, in a shipyard, may have, you may have up to 300 workers on board uh, every day. Right. And managing that whole process. The materials may be slightly different. Well, but, um, more people than I have on my, any of my sites. Yes, yeah, so, 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 so managing a, a, yeah. a project on land is exactly, is exactly the same principle. Mm. So, so that was the, the, the risk element of it. And then, obviously... My, my previous property experience, working with Investor Cash and, and, and whatnot, was I kind of married the two together. Okay, yeah. So that, it, I think to some extent, has given you the ability to see two different sides of the coin to understand mm -hmm. the risks that are involved in the development process. And yeah. I guess managing risk, at least from my view, point of view, is about understanding risk. You've mm -hmm. got to understand it first, and then you can work out how you're going to manage it. One of the, I think one of the biggest problems that developers that are starting out have is that they don't understand the risk they're taking because they don't know they're taking it. Yeah, I'll say one of the things that I've never been, I've never shied away from and never been, uh, ne never let e ego get in the way of. If, if I don't understand something, I'll, I'll go and seek out the best person that, that I can find that's got that experience and I'll try in some way to partner up with them uh, and, and in order to get the, the, the knowledge from them. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I think in a way that's what all entrepreneurs have to do. You just... You just have to work things out. Mm -hmm. if, if you don't know what the answer is, you go and find it. And, and, and tend to look at things from a longer term perspective. So you may, by partnering up with someone in the short term, you may get a, a smaller piece of the pie, but on the long term, that, that pie is going to be much bigger. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree. So when you stopped being a ship's captain or started doing something else, <laughs> whatever that was, um, I know that you... Um, for a while, were doing your own property deals. You somehow got so, involved. So I was still doing that while I was at sea. So when I finished building my yeah. own property, yeah. I was um, so I met up with um, 
Thomas Nust and Tor Portes, my business partner now. Oh, so you've been? On, on a course, well, I'm still at sea, yeah. Right, yeah. on a course, what kind of course? Uh, an NLP course. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, this and NLP course seems to figure very, is a very important event in your life. It, it is, it is. A, you seem to have met a lot of people there. Yeah, 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 I did actually, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I got on very well with both of them. And I've, I've, I've always been pretty good at uh, raising funds. Wow. So uh, I started doing deals with, with, with Thomas, and uh, ma mainly Thomas at the time, oh. and uh, raising finance for, for projects. So what, what sort of deals were you doing with Thomas? Uh, initially it was smaller, uh, smaller uh, housing houses in, uh, in, in and around London, distressed distress deals. So you'd, you'd find a distressed deal, you'd buy and refurbish it and sell it on? Or? Uh, pretty much, yeah, yeah. And uh, this, yeah, Tor's speciality is distress projects as well, so working with the both of them. And then I got into developments with Thomas. So we actually, our, our first, I, I financed Thomas's first property development. Uh -huh. uh, Did you really? All, okay. all, all of the cash into wow. that. So wow. that, was, that was a project in, uh, in Nottingham. Right. It was an office block, uh, uh -huh. which we purchased uh, very cleverly. Obviously, I, I raised the funds. He purchased it very cleverly with his business partner. We needed 125 grand, of which came from one of my investors. And we got permitted development to convert it into 192 uh, student flats. Wow. Um, that was going from three, four bedroom houses to a bit of a jump. Yeah, I would and say so. And we, uh, we actually did a simultaneous, uh, we, 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 we basically looked at that and thought, this is uh, far too big for us, uh, far too big a jump. So uh, it, it was a 600,000 uh, purchase price all in, I think maybe 635. Uh, we had to put in 125 grand cash. We managed to forward fund that or, or, or flip that on to, uh, to, another, to a fund who purchased it for, for 1.2 million. We did a simultaneous exchange and completion with their funds, so we didn't have to, we only, we only used 125 grand and there wow. was 600 grand profit in that. That's a really good way to make money. Mm. Yeah. I mean, it's funny, I think with deals like that, everyone wants to do them clearly, but you can't do deals like that every day. It's no, just unfortunately not. It's an opportunity that comes along and you, when you see it, you've just got to pursue it. But, but again, that, 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 yeah. that's where I was saying it was, it was way out of our comfort zone, but the opportunity was there and I could see the opportunity. I, I weighed up the risks. Um, the, the 125 grand, as far as I was concerned, was, was, was secure. Um, and so that mitigated any, any, any kind of risk there. So, so we just went for it. We, we actually secured it and then thought, oh, this, is a, this is maybe a bit too too big for us, but then I found a way out and uh, yeah, it was very profitable in the end. I think that's a really sound way to proceed. I think you, it's really important that people realise when they're getting into something that is beyond the, their skills and abilities and you know, you, there are lots of ways to address that. You can team up with somebody else who's got exactly, skills yeah, and abilities yeah. or you can just structure a deal in a way that is, means that you're not getting into something that you don't understand. Mm -hmm. yeah. But that, and So that's interesting and that that philosophy kind of of balancing opportunity and risk, I guess, is something that you carried on with you into what you're doing now. Yeah, yeah. But so, where did you go after that in terms of property deals? We used some of the funds from that to, have you, have you, as Thomas told you about Dover Street, which is a 130 unit student let in Leicester. I've lost track of of what Thomas was. Doing so, so that was so much. Sorry, Thomas is a mutual friend of ours. Yes, 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 yes. Thomas Nast. <laughs> That, that was a car park that he bought at auction yeah. for 250 grand. So uh -huh. used some of the funds that we got back from, from that and from my other investors to, to yeah. fund that. And right. it's, um, uh, it's uh, I'm not sure if it's sold or it's, uh, it's, it's in the process of being sold for, for 10 million pounds at the minute. Wow. Uh, why do you guys bother to do anything else apart from property deals? Because you're clearly pretty good at doing it. <laughs> Thomas asked me the same <laughs> thing. <laughs> you should have my job. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, again, I was very good at uh, raising the funds and he was uh, the one yeah. uh, with his, with his uh, other business partner uh, right. finding the deals. Okay. okay. But, but uh, we were in the, in the, on, the, on the other side, Tor and I and Thomas were working on distressed properties, so bankruptcies, repossessions, that type of thing. So during the last recession, yeah. when the banks weren't really lending, yeah. we, we found creative strategies in order to, to take, uh, take over properties. So okay. options, exchange of delayed completion, that type of thing. Yeah. And we take... Uh, um, we take properties where, where, where people were clearly going for an element of pain. Uh, they were going to lose everything. We've yeah. always done it. We've always operated from an ethical business model, which I think is why crowdfunding is a natural fit. So, 
So we'd always take these people from place of pain to, to not necessarily pleasure, but to, to a more comfortable situation. So we, okay. we'd never, um, uh, yeah, people always we wouldn't be- Wouldn't take advantage yeah, of Yeah, exactly, yes, yes, wouldn't take advantage. So we'd, we'd, we'd pay off their credit cards, we'd pay off their bank arrears. Um, we'd make sure they've got enough money so that they can, they can rent a place for the next six or 12 months. You put them onto a stable footing again. E exactly, they, we, we'd um, yeah. Yeah, make sure that their credit rating or credit uh, wasn't, wasn't, they weren't blacklisted in any way. Mm. Um, obviously we'd end up with the property, we'd be generally be buying it at a discount yeah. and, and add value through refurbishment. And we did about 40 of, uh, of those deals or, mm. um, in total. Wow. And, and be because we were uh, very good at what we did, the 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 the, um, uh, the estate agents, no one else was buying. Just kept selling us more and more deals. We were working mm. with private investors. Yeah. We, were, we were running out of private investors to actually work with. Mm. And I remember reading this article uh, about a new thing called crowdfunding. I thought that sounds like a pretty good idea. And I introduced uh, Tor to my other business partner Robert at my wedding in Iceland. Right. And uh, Robert Pasternak. So so he whereas Tor's property background. Robert is um, uh, marketing and programming. So he's, got over, he's had over 20 online businesses, very successful. He's a Google award-winning uh, um, entrepreneur. And, uh, and it was just a natural fit. So we all got together, brainstormed, and all agreed that it was the, the way forward. So when was that? That was, uh, the, the idea was uh, actually in the, the end of 2014. Wow. But this was when the FCA regulated investment in 2014. Yeah. It was so new that, that no one could tell us where to start. Right. So we pretty much spent uh, the next six to nine months asking a lot of questions, lock, knocking on a lot of doors to, uh, to find out how we actually move forward. Mm, interesting. It might interest you to know, actually, that, that in 2013, I actually had the idea of starting a property crowdfunding platform before anyone else was doing it. And the only, only reason I didn't execute on it was that I had too much going on in my property development businesses at the time. So I think... For me, the rise of property crowdfunding is, is interesting because mm -hmm. it's something, I guess, that I had thought about from a long time ago. And I guess I've, I've seen that, that property crowdfunding, particularly equity crowdfunding, has, has taken off in the US. There's some pretty interesting things going on there. I think it's got a long way to run here, actually. Um, so just tell me a little bit about how um, you, you got that business um, started. As I said, so, so it took, uh, took uh, quite a while to, to get everything together. And the other interesting thing is we, we, we put our own tech team together. So wherever right. a lot of companies, white label, we built our, our own platform from the ground up. So we've got programmers, designers, etc. over in Poland. Right. So Rob moved back to Poland. Rob's actually Polish by birth. Yeah. He moved back to Warsaw okay. for, for, for over a year right. and was, uh, was running the team from over there whilst okay. Tor and I uh, were. Do you still, have, you still have that team in Poland? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Right. Right. Whilst yeah. Tor and you were? Tor and I, I were over here. Obviously I was still going to and fro to sea, but one of the benefits of, of the modern world is I was able, and having a large crew on the boat, I was able to, um, to do my day job and, and, and still ah. keep in touch and make sure everything was ticking over from my side using the internet. You were still at sea while this thing was starting? Yes, 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 uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. all right, so Tor was busy then. Well, yeah, well, yeah he, was, he was doing a lot of the legwork and I was uh, yeah. writing emails and communicating from the Caribbean, but it worked well. Yeah, so am I right in understanding that when you first kicked Crowd With Us, crowd with us off, you were just funding your own. Yes, we, we, as I, we, we built the platform to fund our own projects, and so 2017, really, we started. We launched the platform in like kind of in beta mode to uh, with, with our own deals, we spent a number of our own projects uh, on the go, and to get investment in. It was it was a whole different uh, ball game. Then we spent the whole of 2017 sourcing new projects, managing our existing ones, running a regulated platform, and marketing to investors, which in effect is running two businesses, yeah. and uh, nearly killed ourselves. And, and at the same time, we had a number of developers knocking on the door since crowdfunding had become regulated, saying, can we use your platform? Yeah. So at the beginning of last year, we were scratching our heads thinking, why are we doing both when we can actually fund other developers' deals? Yeah. So we, 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 uh, we stopped, we pivoted the model. That's when uh, Brian Levine, who's our head of property, yeah. came on the scene as, as an underwriter. So we decided, what we said was, if we're gonna fund other developers' deals, yeah. we'll only stick uh, deals on the platform that we fund ourselves. And that's not to say that we invest in every deal because we don't. It's just that we do the same level of due diligence. Mm -hmm. So that Brian, you would if you were investing in the deal. Sorry. That you would if you were investing. Yeah, in the that deal. we would. Yeah, if, if, it was, if I stick my own money in, yeah, um, yeah I'll do a, 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 a level of due diligence. And I want to make sure that uh, that we're doing the same for, for our investors. Now, it's really interesting. I think you know that I've used different, lots of different property crowdfunding platforms. I think the thing that I find most interesting about Crowd with us 
is that you guys understand property development in a way that finance people don't. Mm -hmm. Because you've been there and you've done it and you've done your own deals and you know what can go wrong. And I think in, unless you've done that and unless you've got that degree of experience, you're probably not in a position to actually fully disassemble and, and, and do proper due diligence on property deals. Personal view. But also I find from a, dev, a, a developer's perspective, I find, it work, I find working with you guys easy because you understand the issues that developers tend to hit. Mm -hmm. So you know whether or not something is a real issue or it's whether it's just something that somebody's telling you. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, 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 that makes, uh, makes total sense. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, Brian and I took two months out and we wrote the credit policy and our full due diligence framework. So we do DD on the deal, yeah. um, DD on the developer, and then uh, we actually have a lawyer that sits on our side to represent the investor's interests. Yeah. So it's a bank grade due diligence, really. Yeah, and I, I know that because mm -hmm. I've, I've been through that with you. Mm. Rob, it's been a, a real pleasure um, no, having, ha been... having, on the pla having on the program. Just before we kind of sum up, if you bumped into somebody and they asked you um, how they, would, they should get started in property today, what advice would you give them? Education, I think that's uh, education. So going to net networking events, it doesn't have to mean necessarily mean going to attend physical courses, but go to networking events, try and meet uh, people like yourself or, or, or myself that that, uh, that are attending, form form friendships. You want to work with people that have got similar values, and if you, you may find that there's people out there that have got the experience, like yourself, you've got a lot of experience, but you might be a bit time poor. So, so they, they can do um, yeah, an earn to learn or something, so, yeah. so they could partner up with you. Well, I do think that the internet and the amount of content, like this kind of content, for example, mm -hmm. that's, that's available on yeah. the internet yeah. these yeah, days, means sure. that you can actually learn an, an immense amount mm -hmm. without necessarily even needing to meet anybody. Yep. You can go out and, and consume that content, you can learn an, a, a lot about a lot of things. It's, it's such a, a broad resource. I, I, I totally agree. I, I listen to a lot of podcasts. I, I mean, yeah. no, even in our situation, you, you, never, you should never stop learning. Yeah. So I'm always, always listening to podcasts, audio books. Yeah. 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 And I think that's something that, that's really valuable. It's one of the things actually that I look to deliver with this, um, this vlog, the, the main thing. Um, it's about trying to deliver value to people who are interested in property development or interested in property investment. It's about helping them learn how it works, how, how they can do it themselves. And, and one of the things, just very quickly, uh, and we're, we're not the only platform out there, but one of the benefits that, that crowdfunding has brought about is it's kind of removed the financial barrier to entry mm. uh, for getting into property, so you can actually invest uh, smaller amounts. And you know, I, I agree. It gives investors access to deals that would previously only have been available to large private equity investors yeah. and, and the levels of return on those deals, I think that's the important thing. It gives them access to a level of return that they otherwise would not have been able to achieve. It democratises um, the world of finance. So there was previously, I think, a, a financial barrier to getting involved in those sorts of deals for investors. But it also offers developers an opportunity to form offers and put them out to the market um, without having to rely on trying to pull one big fish of, of an investor in. So I think it's a win-win for developers and, and investors. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Rob, always a pleasure speaking to you. Likewise. This is The Main Thing. I'm Evan Maindonald. Rob, thanks for coming on the show. My pleasure. We'll see you all soon.